North Carolina Republicans are out of control, from misogynistic candidates to blatant gerrymandering to power grabs. It is clear that the North Carolina GOP is committed to anti-democracy. State Democratic leader Robert Reeves is here to discuss all of this and more. This is Defending Democracy, a weekly podcast from Democracy Docket. I'm Mark Elias. Thank you, Leader, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so I want to ask you the the question that I always sort of try to start with, which is um, you joined the state house in 2014 and became the Democratic leader uh, of the state um, uh, uh, Democrats in 2020. What made you decide to run for office to begin with? You know, how did you decide to to that what you wanted to do was be involved in politics uh, in North Carolina? <laughs> But I appreciate the question. And the short answer, I didn't decide to run for office and I didn't decide I was going to be in politics. It was uh, my father has been a long time county commissioner. He served uh, longer than anybody else in the county, 34 years. And he'd also served at the state level legislative council with lieutenant governor. And so that had kind of decided for me that I probably wasn't going into politics. And <laughs> we um, we we had an opening. We got gerrymandered. We were part of the racial gerrymandering suit. And so our district eventually got redrawn. But at that time, uh, we had a gerrymandered district. Our representative stepped down midterm. And so there was an appointment process for the new person. And um, uh, one of my really good friends who became my campaign manager really wanted me to run. And she really felt I should. But even though our county was only a very, very small percentage of the county. So we short version is she did all the footwork. She pushed, she pushed, and she finally got me to say yes. Uh, she told me on Saturday night, she said, give it till Sunday morning. I said, well, Sunday's not going to change, but okay. And when I woke up Sunday morning, she had created a Facebook page. She got 500 likes. And she was like, now will you run? And so I was like, fine, put my name in for the appointment. And that was it. And uh, the same thing kind of happened for leader. I was, uh, I'd been deputy leader. Um, I'd had a lot of people in the caucus who had talked to me about running for leader uh, my second term because our leader was stepping down. And of course, second term, there was just no universe where I thought I was ready for that. One of my friends said, hey, I'll do it if you'll be my deputy. I said, fine. So he and I were meeting for lunch after the election. I was actually, I think like December 1st or 2nd. And he said, I'm stepping down. I think you should be leader. And I said, I'm sorry to hear you're stepping down. And no, I don't want to be leader. And two weeks later, I was running for leader. So that was it. Wow. Sounds like uh, sounds like your friends are, are not doing you any favors. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I still love them both dearly. <laughs> so, so um, you know, Sitting in Washington, D.C., which is where I am, I went to school uh, in North Carolina, and I know you went to UNC, uh, you're yes. a proud UNC graduate. I went to law school for Duke, so I hope that doesn't end this interview uh, prematurely. Uh, but, um, you know, one of the things that I've marveled at is that on the one hand, North Carolina is actually a pretty evenly divided state. You know, you have um, uh, you have a Democratic governor, uh, have had a history of Democratic governors and Democratic senators. Uh, president Obama won the state uh, for president. It was a competitive state uh, last time um, uh, in the presidential election. And yet the Republican Party of North Carolina is among the most power hungry, anti-democracy, you know, state legislature in the country. I mean, it's it's you would think that that it would have a more moderate veneer to it, but it is actually among the worst, you know, set of Republicans when it comes to, you know, gerrymandering, attacking voting rights. <laughs> uh, uh, and I'm just curious if you have a perspective as what is it as an outsider we are missing about the state of North Carolina that has that has produced this kind of very extremist Republican uh, caucus? Well, I think there's a couple of factors. The number one factor that we that a lot of outsiders would miss that I think um, even people inside the state miss is the money. Uh, you know, when you get a couple of billionaires that decide they don't like the way things went, they can change your world in an instant. And that's what happened here. We had one billionaire in particular who just made the decision, we're not having this happen again. So, and what I mean by happening again is you realize when Obama won in 2008, that was the first time a Democrat had won the presidential uh, for this state in years. 
And, you know, for various reasons, they were dead set that wasn't going to happen again. And so uh, I, I would just say that they put in the money and the effort and they were able to get a lot of people elected first time to office in 2010 and, and completely take the legislature over. The second thing is people generally, especially Democrats, have never understood how powerful legislatures are and how powerful Congress is. And so while Democrats were happy to win presidential elections, gubernatorial elections, Republicans were taking complete focus on state legislatures because they understand when you really think about it, if you take over a state legislature, you decide who the Congress people will be in the House. So the only thing that you don't directly decide or who your two senators are and who your governor is or your council of state people. But if you've got all these others in place, you can put things in place to keep those folks from getting elected. So that was number two. Number three, I think ultimately what was missed here is that national Republicans recognized the importance of the South in supporting their movement. They understood that, you know, we're not going to go to New York and California and Maryland and these places, spend a bunch of money, and get banged for your buck. So the same thing that our local billionaire did statewide, he recognized, look, if I put $500,000 into five rural counties, that's more legislators than put $500,000 in to win one seat in Raleigh. So why don't I go into these rural counties, take these seats, get more votes? The same thing the National Republicans said. They said, look, if we'll take places like North Carolina, South Carolina, and all these spots, and we'll turn them red, that's just as valuable as having one senator out of New York. And they were correct. So I think those were all those factors. And we've kind of unfortunately been the guinea pigs for a lot of the bad that Republicans have done throughout the country. Yeah. And, and, you know, when, and I do want to say this. When I speak of Republicans, I'm speaking of their present leadership. I'm not speaking of the voters. I'm not speaking of people who have grown up in this era, because I don't think anybody who grew up as Republicans that's my age recognizes the leadership they have now. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I was actually going to make that. I was actually going to make that point. That what's interesting is it's almost like the national Republicans and probably some big money interests and people in state. They 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 woke up at one point and realized that North Carolina was kind of a um, uh, kind of a firewall for them. You know, yeah. you had you had Virginia, you know, become more increasingly Democratic, and for many many years. I mean, many years, you know, going back to when you were first elected, there was a real sense that that North Carolina, because of the, the research triangle area, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, because of the growth of Charlotte, um, that you really were going to see a transformation of North Carolina uh, into being kind of the next state where Democrats would be able to um, achieve parity or even become uh, you know, uh, go from uh, red to purple and even purple to blue. And so they kind of doubled down on this. And I think you're right. They kind of left a lot of their voters, you know, homeless. A lot of those, a lot of those Republicans who were in Charlotte or, you know, in the triangle area. Uh, and I know you have, you know, you have part of, you have part of Durham and part of, um, uh, part of uh, Wake County. Uh, you know, that, you know, those folks, I'm sure, feel quite homeless in some sense. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the thing. And that was something I discussed when we were all going around uh, when we did our last round of redistricting. Well, I guess that was two rounds ago. And, and that was one of the points I tried to make when I was talking to especially Republican groups about the effects of gerrymandering. And what they've done is they've just told you, if you live in an urban area, good luck. We're going to make sure we maintain overall state control, but as far as your local county, as far as the people that you see every day, your county commissioners and city council, good luck. We're not investing there anymore, and you guys are on an island, and they're almost encouraging people not to live in those areas. And I mean, sometimes you'll hear them openly say uh, to abandon those areas. And so that is a sad thing, um, but, but I think, again, it was a strategic move to make sure that they keep overall power, which they've been as successful at doing. Yeah. So let me ask you a question about um, voting rights in North Carolina. You know, you you came to you came into office uh, right after the Shelby County decision uh, 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 took took uh, took effect in 20 uh, in 2013. Um, uh, you came to the legislature right after that. You came in power. You came into the legislature just as Republicans had enacted uh, a massive voter suppression law. 
that was ultimately overturned in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, the case that I was involved in helping litigate for the plaintiffs, uh, where the where the uh, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down the the law, saying that it targeted. Um, uh, black voters with uh, near surgical precision. That was the term that 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 they used. Yeah. Um, and the the history of that legislation was that, in fact, that's what happened. The Republican legislative leadership had sort of scored the provisions that would have the greatest negative impact on black voters and targeted those provisions and left out provisions that might inconvenience white voters. I'm just curious, you know, your since your time in the legislature has kind of been bookended by that, and now, the most recent uh, uh, voter suppression bills that now seem to become more frequently. Um, how much of, how much do you think that the Republican Party success um, and their commitment is around these issues of voter suppression and targeting black voters, young voters, other voters who they just don't think are gonna vote for them. So rather than trying to persuade them, uh, they try to exclude them from the process. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt that that's what uh, the basis of the success is. And and when I say this, this what they've been successful at doing is getting less wealthy groups, period, to to get frustrated with the process. And mm -hmm. so the types of th attacks that they make now are not the types of attacks that you saw in the 50s and 60s. In the 50s and 60s were physical intimidation, things of that sort. Now they do a smarter form of intimidation. They just make life more difficult overall. And so they, they attack areas that don't seem obvious, but they understand our margins are razor thin. We had a statewide race for chief justice, which would have actually changed the entire course of this state. Absolutely. And it's going to be a significant point when people look back 20 years from now in the history of this state. 400 votes. So all they've got to do is basically shave off 40 votes per county, which is nothing. And all they've got to do is get 40 people to decide it wasn't worth it. So they do things like voter ID. They do things like, you know, all of the factors that you saw in the bill, cutting early voting, changing early voting sites. One of the first things I remember when I got in office was down east, them taking an early voting site from a majority black area, moving it 45 minutes across the county. That makes a difference. So if you're working a nine to five job, you can't go vote at lunchtime. Now, instead of going across the street to vote, you can't do it. Then taking away Sunday voting in some early places in places and all of those type of things. And so, you know, again, they understand some of these voters that were able to coalesce and come together to uh, give North Carolina to Obama in 08, they could persuade away. You know, they could they could put out different boogeymen in front of them and make them say, oh, whoa, well, we can't vote like that again. But the voters, they could not do that to. They just disenfranchised. And I think they're open about it. They're honest about it. But people aren't used to that. People are used to subversion. People are used to you sneaking behind the scenes and doing things. Now they tell you what they're doing. Yeah. It's just a matter of how you're going to respond. And so, yeah, I think that that is it. Because what we've learned is when voters get educated, not educated in the sense of college education, post-college but educated in understanding how all this works and how all this fits together, they vote for us every time. And so their point is, well, we're going to make sure that those voters that you're going to have the best chance of reaching don't get a chance to reach the polls. Yeah. So I want to talk about another anti-democracy initiative that we have seen the legislature in North Carolina really, I mean, shockingly, in my view, you know, as someone who observes the state, a shocking effort to... Um, to undermine um, election administration in the state. So they they passed a bill, SB 749. It was just struck down by uh, the trial court or three-judge panel, I should say, uh, in North Carolina um, that would change the composition of the election boards. What people outside of North Carolina need to know is that while mo in many states, the secretary of state is the chief election official, and then there are county registrars or county clerks, North Carolina actually has a really innovative and frankly, very successful model um, of election administration. Uh, and Republicans have been at the Republican legislature. You're, you, make, you make a good point. When I say Republicans, I don't mean the rank and file Republicans. The Republican legislature has been at sort of war with allowing this free and fair election administration process to exist. Can you tell people in a nutshell kind of what 
what is what's going on here? What are what Republicans are trying to achieve in uh, in in this bill, uh, uh, and why it is so important that the courts struck it down? Power and money. That's what all this boils down to. And so, what people need to understand is this: in a true democracy, where you truly have three separate uh, entities running your government. The, the reason you need the separation of powers, we create laws, we should never execute those laws or interpret those laws. The governor's branch is the executive branch, executes those laws. The judicial branch should give a fair and impartial interpretation of the laws. What they're doing is they're taking all of the power that they can. Appointment power is a huge deal mm -hmm. because what folks don't understand is a lot of stuff that they care about with state government depends on who's running that particular division. And you can't vote for that. You, you can't vote for the people on these boards. You can't vote for the secretaries of these different uh, areas of government. And so when they take that appointment power and bring that to the legislature, then what you're doing is you're making the governor a figurehead. And so suddenly your three branches of government have now reduced to two. And then if, you know, for people who are cynical, and I'm not one of those at this time, they've already taken over the judicial branch because, you know, we're reopening cases now, you know, as an attorney, um, how shocking it is for a case to get reopened, not because there's been a change in law, not because there's been a change in facts or circumstances, but because somebody literally says, yeah, those other judges didn't know what they were talking about. Let's let's go back and look at these decisions that people have been making life plans on and reopen these cases and give different decisions. We're getting ready to see the same thing with Leandro. I hope we don't, but it really does feel like that we've got a court in place that feels like it's completely beholden to Republican leadership. And the other thing folks don't understand is the Speaker of the House and the President pro tem on your best days with your best separation of government are the two most powerful people in the state, no matter what party they are. Right. When you do these kind of power grabs and you have a judicial branch who bows to those people, they are in fact an unchecked autocracy. Hmm. They are in fact no different than if the king, they've actually got more power than the King of England. <laughs> you know, because the King of England is actually more of a, you know, symbolic position. You have just combined the King of Eng England and the Prime Minister of England into two people and went into one group. That's the legislature. And you can't vote them out because, of course, if I'm, you know, for instance, we'll use Chatham County where I'm from. If I'm from Chatham County and I'm delivering all these goods to Chatham County and I'm the most powerful person in the state, why on earth would Chatham want to vote me out, whether I'm Democrat or Republican? And that's what they've done. Yeah. Um, and it's quite scary. I mean, it's it, as I said at the beginning, you know, the 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 anti the, the commitment to anti-democratic legislation and the in, the 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 diminishment of gov of the governor of North Carolina has been a constant theme of the Republican leadership of the of the of the state house and state senate. Um I, I I have to I have to sort of double back to something you said about the judiciary because you've mentioned it a couple of times now. First of all, I think you're exactly right that you know um, Chief Justice um, Beasley, who was the uh, uh, who was a very very strong and uh, excellent jurist, was defeated in her reelection by, as you say, 400 votes. And you know you you look at the amount of money and energy that Republicans put into that race. Um, and and you just ask, like, wh how much would be different in the state of North Carolina right now if that had turned out differently? You know, it's not just it's not just the voting cases. I mean, you know, in my arena, the everything would be different about North Carolina, all yes. of the voting and democracy cases. But even just the quality of life that 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 North Carolinians, you know, it's just a tragedy of what's happened there. And and I painted a little bit further back. Um, and I'm curious your reaction to this. You know, most states, when I tell when I tell people that, you know, that there are Republican judges, sometimes they'll correct me and they'll be like, oh, you mean conservatives? And I'm like, well, you know, there's been a trend in this country to move away from partisan elections for judges. Unfortunately, right. the Supreme Court, unfortunately, the US Supreme Court still has upheld it as, as allowable. But the but the modern trend has been away from that, right? Because the idea is. You don't want your you don't want your state courts, your state Supreme Court to identify with a party. You don't want them to feel like if the legislative leadership are 
Democrat or Republican, they're on the same team, right? You know, you you look at the U.S. Supreme Court and for all its foibles, they you know they sit there stoically at the State of the Union because they're they're trying to send a message. They're not on either team. And what's really really uh, uh, to me an underreported story about the the erosion of democracy in North Carolina was a decision by the Republican legislature in the state to actually take what was a nonpartisan elected uh, court and make it, force it, force it to run in partisan elections. And I'm just wondering if you can just talk a little bit about it from your perspective, why they did that and the impact that has had on the courts. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Republican judges that have not towed the party line have been attacked openly by the Republican Party of this state and by other Republican judges. Uh, you look at Donna Stroud. I mean, you know, you, you've got folks that, you know, they've not gone off and become, quote unquote, crazy liberals. They've simply interpreted the law as they believe and they've gotten attacked. I'll tell you, you want to talk about underreported. We had five judges in our budget whose positions were taken, hmm. just taken away. Really? And it got replaced after about three days. But if you think that didn't send a message and you know what all those judges had in common, they sat on one of these constitutional panels, which was also an underreported case, uh, a, a story whenever I got in, even creating these constitutional panels where the chief justice decides who's going to decide what's constitutional. But all of them have sat on panels, is my understanding, that had found against the legislature. And so they just took them. And it just so happened four of those five judges were black judges. And you mm -hmm. think about that. You've got a judge in your county, Superior Court judge, one of the most powerful positions in the state, who is doing their job. No corruption, no bad things, not getting out here, being overly political or anything of that sort. But because they made a decision that those in power didn't like, they suddenly didn't have a job. And again, their jobs got brought back, but that message was sent loud and clear. Another underreported story. So we're in the midst of, again, reopening a redistricting case that I still have not heard the legal basis for reopening when we had to redraw our maps. And we give an extension to judges for how long they've got to wait till they retire. So you've given them three to four extra years on the bench and you've given them extra money. And when you count up all that money, and, I, and I'm not saying there's a direct correlation on the money. So I don't want anybody to say after this, oh, you're trying to say we got paid or anything like that. But what I'm saying is we control their budgets. We yeah. control their salaries. And then on top of that, now they're beholden to the party leadership. How on earth can you expect a normal human being to make fair, impartial decisions against folks? And you add all that in, it is a frightening turn of events for people because when you can't go to the courts to get fair treatment, where do you go as a normal citizen? That's right. And, and, you know, you're, I'm going to say something that, you know, I think you're too polite to say. The fact is that, of course, the race of those judges mattered to the Republicans. Like, you don't have to agree. You can, you can say, you know, by happenstance, but I'm here to say there's no chance it was by happenstance. I mean, I, I've litigated as many voting and election cases in North Carolina as anyone. Okay. I, I, litigated i struck down the congressional maps in the u.s supreme court in the 20 after the after they drew them in 2010 you know in in uh in um uh, cooper v harris we struck it down what was the basis of striking it down it was a racial gerrymander the republican leadership different leaders but the republican leadership drew those maps to disadvantage black voters. And I'm, that's not me saying it. That is what the U.S. Supreme Court, the conservative U.S. Supreme Court agreed was the case. Now, what they come back with, they came back with a extreme partisan gerrymander. And then uh, my team was involved in helping strike that case, strike that map down. For a brief period of time, we got lawful maps in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was that you saw a multiracial coalition of people being you know, able to elect candidates of choice. Um, you know, I, I've always, I've, I've talked about on previous podcasts and in my writings, you know, Reverend Barber is one of the reasons I got into this work. And for those of you who don't know the work he did he, uh, in North Carolina with Moral Mondays, you're missing a lot of what the real story is about how you can build 
multiracial coalitions, multi-issue coalitions to really make progressive change and make democracy work in states like North Carolina. And so I've seen the role that race has played in the way in which Republicans going back to targeting black voters with surgical precision in the 2013 bill, in the racial gerrymandering context, in even the partisan gerrymandering cases, how they have targeted um, particularly black voters. And it is a disgrace and it is a shame. And like I said, you don't have to agree with me on it, but that is that is my perspective as a litigator in this state who watches what cases get brought, what cases get decided. And, and to your point, what case what cases have now been sort of summarily reversed <laughs> you know to answer your question you know and in disclosure as i've said here my my law firm has been involved in these cases there was no there was no change in the law there was nothing really? about the law that required the the state supreme court to revisit on 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 the flimsiest of theories on the on the absolute flimsiest of theories to revisit and to reverse um, uh, uh, you know, a couple of these cases, including the very, very important redistricting case that my firm was involved in, um, uh, other than the vote total changed on the court. Yep. And if, you know, and if you want to know what happens when you get out of line, I mean, heck, look at what happened to our superintendent of public education race and, and why it's so important that we shouldn't have partisan races when it comes to judicial and education. You got a person raised $50,000 and beat a sitting incumbent superintendent. Um, you know, because they wanted to be more radical. You know, they came out and talked about everything but school. And because of the Republican infrastructure, you know, able to oust an incumbent just like that because they're more willing to toe the party line. It's so speaking of the party line, I can't not use this opportunity to ask you, what the hell is going on with that party's gubernatorial uh, candidate? I mean... You know, I've never been a big fan of Republican ca candidates for governor, uh, generally. You know, I, I support Democratic candidates for governor. But, right. I mean, Mark Robinson running for governor, I mean, what what are they thinking? I mean, in fairness, Robinson is probably not even the most radical of the council of state races. I mean, you know, he's the one that gets the most coverage because he says the most bombastic things. And yes, it's a really difficult pill to swallow that that person could be the person that we're sitting down with the next time a Toyota comes to us and says, hey, we want to locate in your state. And he's seeing all these people, you know, that are, well, uh, you know, maybe people he doesn't want in the state. That's going to be hard. But with that being said, if you look at the attorney general's race, if you look at the superintendent's race, these are the members that, in fact, if you look at the primary for the Republicans last Tuesday, every single candidate that was even semi-mainstream, you're not talking about, again, liberal bell cows or rhinos. You're talking about people who have towed the Republican Party line for the last 10 years, but suddenly were looked at as mainstream candidates Every one of them lost. They lost hmm. congressional bids. They lost council of state races. They're retiring out of the House. Like the caucus that we're going to come back to whenever uh, 2025 hits, no matter how successful Democrats are or are not, that Republican caucus will mostly be made up of what is now the Freedom Caucus. And again, I've got nothing against the Freedom Caucus. They are who they are. They're honest about who they are. But according to the North Carolina chamber who rarely comes out and, and, and still did not come out and support the Democrats. Let me be clear. I don't want them to think, I think they came out and support Democrats, but the North Carolina chamber came out and says, guys, you've got to pay attention to what's getting ready to happen to our business climate based on the Republican primaries. And that is, has never happened in my lifetime where the North Carolina chamber has come out after a Republican primary and says, we're concerned about the people who won these primaries. So my point is that you know, is he radical? Yes. It is very emblematic of the leadership that is being put in place because, again, the decision makers aren't the people that are being elected. The decision makers are the people who fund these campaigns. And I, I think voters in North Carolina got to recognize that, that a lot of them are spending money with companies that are then taking that money and electing these kind of people because they know that they will toe the party line. Yeah, I think it's a really important 
point that you make, you know, again, I'm not a big um, fan of the Chamber of Commerce. They seem to always find a way to endorse Republicans. But, you know, the story of North Carolina, and obviously there's many stories, but one of the stories of North Carolina is the state has transformed itself. It is it is um, one of the largest banking centers in the world. I mean, literally, yeah. Charlotte is one of the largest banking cities in the world. Um, the Triangle area, Triangle area is the driver of of so much technology and education, you know, the the you have these world class universities throughout the state, not just in the triangle, but throughout the state, you have a world class university system, both a public system and a private system, a large school system and a small school system. Uh, uh, throughout the state, you've got you've got um, tourism and uh, tremendous uh, growth in that sector in the in the east and in the west in the mountains. Uh, you've got a burgeoning movie industry uh, in uh, in the Wilmington area. So, you know, this is a dynamic growing state that has really um, done an amazing job of of leading in so many areas. You mentioned um, uh, manufacturing. I don't want to sound like the the booster of the of the of the North, of the North, of North Carolina, but and they've got to be they all of these industries and businesses have to be looking, you know, if you're the chancellor of the UNC system, if you're the president of Duke University, if you're trying to cite a movie in, uh, you know, in Wilmington, or you're opening a factory, uh, as you say, a car factory, or a bank thinking about, you know, where does it want to headquarter its next, uh, uh, its next headquarters, like, this all has to be very concerning as someone in the legislature, you know, who has to, who's trying to do better for your constituents and make their lives better and bring jobs and economic opportunity. This has got to be a real worry. Oh, no, it's past a real worry. Banking is a great thing that you brought up, Mark, and, and education. We have lost three chancellors at historically important universities in this state in the last 12 months. Hmm. North Carolina a and North Carolina Central, who, are, you know, and North Carolina a and is one of the most important HBCUs in the country. Absolutely. North Carolina Central is one of the most historic HBCUs in the country. Absolutely. And Durham. University of North Carolina Chapel Hill is the preeminent Southern University and one of the preeminent Southern public universities in the entire country. And that's not by mistake. I'll never believe that's by mistake. And then banking. You're talking about a spot where we have made our own. And what have we done in response? We have heard elected Republicans attack Wells Fargo on the floor and dare them to challenge them about certain bills they've passed. Attacking Bank of America. Look at what happened in Texas to Bank of America and don't think it's not coming here, you know, and, and making them do business with certain types of businesses. But we've gotten rid of affirmative action and now we've run bill after bill to attack diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, movements within private companies. Again, it's bad enough that they're doing it at the state level. But they're telling private companies, you can't go out and get the best talent. You can't even go out and seek the best talent and seek people who will allow you to get the best talent. What we're telling you, multi-billion dollar corporation who doesn't need us for anything, it can go locate anywhere that they want to. We're telling you, we better not hear that you are asking people about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what's always forgotten and why it's interesting what always happens when you talk about DEI is the smart thing Republicans do is immediately pivot it to race. This isn't about race. Mm -hmm. Diversity, equity, inclusion means Western whites that grow up in the mountains. It means women. It means normal, different, normally different groups that are underrepresented in these industries who have a lot to give. So again, it becomes about economics. So what it's saying is this, if you grew up in the wrong rural zip code in North Carolina, as a white person, and we recognize as a company that we don't have enough representation of people that have grown up like you, who didn't go to the country clubs with us, who didn't go to get to go to the exclusive private uh, elementary schools and high schools and universities, that we decide we need more people like you in our business, we can't ask about it if it's up to this Republican legislature. And that is insane because the industries that we are developing have depended on the diversity of their employment base to become the global successes that they have, all of them have. If you talk to them, they're not hiring for fun, they're getting the best people and those people happen to be diverse. Yeah. And how dare we step in as a government full of people, electeds who have never done that. We don't have people in there that have created 
you know, multi-billion dollar banks. We've got people who have workplaces, but you have not been the driver. We've not got people who have created the biosciences industry, the film and entertainment industry. We don't know what it takes to create something that everybody else in the country wants to buy. And you're not going to survive by having an organization that that's all it does is try to figure out how to make some person in the General Assembly happy about what their workforce looks like. We won't survive. Yeah. So let me turn this back to democracy with the time we have uh, the time we have remaining. Um, you know, I was involved in uh, representing uh, Dan McCready, who was a candidate in North Carolina for, for Congress. Um, in a house, in a um, post-election, very odd uh, situation um, involving voter fraud. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> involving um, Mark Harris, who was the Republican candidate who um, had uh, had appeared to have won the election. This was a congressional district uh, in Blade that covered Bladen County, North Carolina, and surrounding counties. Uh, Mark Harris's campaign was uh, found by the by the election board. To have engaged to have engaged vendors and otherwise been involved in widespread uh, election fraud, probably the most significant election fraud in our country's history in the last fifty years, at least, uh, what took place in North Carolina at the hands of this Republican uh, candidate. I actually was in the mid middle of cross examining Mark Harris when he conceded that there needed to be a, that the election needed to be set aside and there needed to be a new election. Uh, which was ordered, the Republican members of the state board of elections agreed and voted that there needed to be a new election, uh, something which did not appear to be a likelihood going into the hearing since the members of that board were chosen to be partisan Republicans. Uh, so, you know, at the time, everyone agreed this was a massive fraud. Um, the Republicans agreed, the Republican Party of North Carolina agreed, even Mark Harris uh, seemed to agree. People eventually went to prison, went to, got convicted um, uh, of crimes as a result of this, Republican operatives uh, and the like. And yet here we are, and Mark Harris has now won a Republican primary. Uh, he is now seems to have been embraced by the Republican Party. He and they seem to have sort of just re revised history. Uh, they now uh, seem to act like somehow he was the victim uh, of, of of something. They invoke my name with, uh, you know, as if somehow I, I, you know, I did something other than help along with the election board and other lawyers for the state expose uh, what what happened? Uh, what does it say to you about the state of the Republican Party in North Carolina that, as you say, along with, you know, who they're fielding for statewide office, what they're doing in the legislature, that, you know, we have this we have this, um, you know, this emblem uh, of of their commitment to um, or their abandonment of of their alleged commitment to anti voter fraud? Well, I think in my mind is this, is that at some point it's on voters to hold people responsible. Mm -hmm. You can't say that you stand for an ideal and then act in opposition to that ideal. And that's where my frustration is. And I, and I don't say this as somebody sitting from the sideline throwing rocks. What I can tell you is this. I believe the same thing for my party and any other organization I'm with. If this person is going to commit a crime, and that was a crime, you cannot then turn around and re-embrace them because it keeps you in power. And what it seems is that the whole point is keeping power. I mean, because it wasn't just him that ran, they, they ran his son also. <laughs> I mean, you know, I did, just, I, did not, I did not know that. Yeah, they ran his son for the legislature. And so, you know, again, I'm not judging anybody. What I'm saying is you can't say that I believe in X, Y, Z, and this is what it's got to be. And that's why I'm passing all these laws is because I want to avoid any type of voter fraud and then embrace the folks involved in the greatest case of voter fraud in the history of this state, probably one of the biggest in the history, recent history of this country. Obviously things were worse before the sixties. We understand that, but it is, in, is incredible to me. So again, at some point, voters have to look at actions and stop listening to words. And that's what I hope that folks will take out of that is just saying that, look, obviously you're not that serious about what you tell me you're serious about. And obviously you're not doing the things that you're doing for the reasons you tell me you are. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know which son it was. One of his sons uh, was actually one of the surprise witnesses that sort of turned him in, uh, <laughs> which was which was That's kind of one Okay. The other thing, though, that was interesting that I, again, I can't not, I can't let this moment um, uh, pass. Uh, I think that one of the lessons from that experience was the victims in that instance is were the voter. Um, in particular, the victims in that instance were black voters. You know, uh, I, I think that, I think that if, if the victims of that, of that situation had been uh, white, uh, country club Republicans in, uh, you know, in in Raleigh. Um, I, I wonder how quickly it'd be forgotten. But honestly, you know, you could not have sat through that hearing. You could not have heard the testimony of the witnesses, including individual voters, without just your heart breaking. Because this this is this was a not wealthy county that mm -hmm. desperately needed uh, good representation desperately needed its politicians to do the right thing. And there was a vicious campaign to demonize black voters. And ultimately it was the black voters who were the subject of the, were the victims of the fraud. It was their, it was their votes who were being stolen um, and otherwise defrauded. And so, you know, I think that, 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 you know, apropos of what I said before, uh, you know, you cannot, you cannot understand the history of voting in this country without understanding the history of Jim Crow. You cannot understand the legacy of voter suppression in this country without understanding how much race is still an important factor in how, in who gets to vote and who doesn't, whose vote counts and whose vote doesn't. And too often when we, when we talk about things like long line, when we talk about things like voter ID, when we talk about things like gerrymandering, what we are really doing is we're using very legalistic terms to talk about processes by which black voters in particular, young voters also, Hispanic voters, other communities, sometimes poor rural white voters, as you as you point out, are disadvantaged. But we cannot we cannot uh, understand the history of of what Republicans, in my view, this is now what I'm saying. Not I'm not asking you to agree, but you cannot understand what Republicans in the state legislature in North Carolina have done over the last 10 decades without understanding that it starts with them targeting Black voters with near surgical precision. It proceeds to a system of, of, of laws that are disadvantaging uh, Black voters, that are gerrymandering, illegally race, uh, violating um, uh, the Constitution and racially gerrymandering in targeting uh, the black woman chief justice of the state supreme court who was a you know who was by all measures a pro business moderate uh, uh, nonpartisan justice you know and so i think it's it really um I, I think that that is part of the story that people need to understand about what we have seen in north carolina and elsewhere but i want to ask you one last question um mm -hmm. uh uh to end this you know we've talked about a lot of the bad We've talked about the challenges that, that North Carolina has, um, uh, that they have drawn new congressional and state legislative maps that only further entrench their powers. Uh, but, but you know, you're both a individual elected leader who has, you know, constituents who turn to you uh, when they need help and expect you to help solve their problems. You're also the Democratic leader. Uh, who is responsible for not just your own constituents, but for organizing, you know, uh, uh, Democrats in the legislature uh, who who cover, who represent a lot of different constituencies across the state. You know, what gives you hope? What I said to you earlier, that when we talk to people and explain to them what's going on, they always convert. And, and, and it is, that gives me a lot of hope because I think what's happened is people are, finally putting it together and 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 I and I think it's getting easier. I think as the wealth gap grows, I think as we continue to watch the record profits that companies are making now and things of that sort, we're recognizing that we have created a system that is meant to keep us from becoming the best versions of ourselves. It is uh and and that's what does it. When I talk to people and explain to them the ridiculous amount of money in campaigns now. When I talk to them about why their votes, you know, why, why things are made more difficult for them to vote, why their votes are so hard. I mean, it is it is interesting to watch the light come on. What 
I think ultimately will save us as a country and as a state and as a country is that people are recognizing, and I agree with you, it's, it's, there's no issue that a lot of the voter suppression that you have seen has been aimed towards black voters, minor, minority voters, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. What I'm hoping is also happening is that multiracial coalition that you discussed earlier comes back because one, you know, the good thing is children are growing up differently. I, I look at my kids and I look at their friend groups and people around, they're growing up differently. Two, I think a lot of people are recognizing our differences aren't about race, our differences are about money. And you've got some really wonderful people with tremendous amounts of wealth who are trying to make the world a better place. You've also got some people with tremendous amounts of wealth who are spending every dollar they can to try to make the world a worse place. They're trying to make sure that nobody can ever catch them or their descendants or anything of that sort. And when folks recognize that the best way to equalize that is through government, then we win elections. When they recognize that if children are healthy, well-educated, and then as adults are well-employed, that we're all better off no matter who we are, and that it's not a zero-sum game, we're good. What Republican leadership has been good at so far is telling people it's a zero-sum game. If Mark does well, there's no way that Robert can do well, and that's just a lie, and, and that's what gives me hope. Well, Leader, um, thank you for that. Thank you for everything you're doing for the people of North Carolina, for Democrats around the country, for citizens around the country. Um, you are an inspiration. Um, you are such an inspiration that I let slide the fact that you said that UNC was the preeminent university in North Carolina. Uh, uh, I, I, and I did not interject uh, that, uh, that, you know, my, my wife, the uh, the Duke uh, graduate and uh, uh, would disagree, but so I'm going to let that go. I'll, I'll let you I have that. said public. It, public was in my mind. Yes. All right. Public was in your mind. We'll, <laughs> let, we'll, let, we'll let that go. Thank you very much for, for joining us on Defending Democracy. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. You can find all of the cases and articles we mentioned today linked in the description of this episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. To find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and make sure to subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Ali Rothenberg, Gabby Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Gabby Corporal and Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.